Praise God. If you would, turn with me and maybe just uh, turn um, my mic down a little bit. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm afraid I'm... But we've been talking about the Lord's Prayer, and we've specifically, these last three weeks, have attempted to answer the question, does God tempt us? But let's begin by first reading the Lord's Prayer. Matthew 6, verses 9 through 13. Pray then in this way, Jesus speaking here, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us pray. Father, thank you so much once again for your glorious presence in our midst. Thank you, Lord, for every precious saint who is here today and for the love of Jesus. We ask now that as we look to your word, you once again would send your anointing upon us. Give words to this, your speaker today. Give us all ears to hear what your Holy Spirit is saying. That in our lives, your name might be glorified. And we ask this in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. The Lord's Prayer. The elements of our communion with the Lord Jesus Christ laid out, and the, and the Heavenly Father, laid out for us in this wonderful, beautiful scripture. We've looked at different aspects of this prayer and, and, and different items that it, it touches or, or speaks on, and now we're looking at the last one, the issue that deals with dealing with both... <coughs> excuse me this morning, dealing with both temptation and the tempter. Temptation and the tempter. We all know what temptation is. At least I know what temptation is. I know on December the 4th, I'm going to be tempted because I've already partook of eating lots of strawberry cream cake, whatever that stuff is. <laughs> Too much! But I don't think, in fact, I know there will be people who will say, namely my wife, who's downstairs in nursery this morning, who will not encourage me to eat it, but perhaps Jim, in his care for his pastor, and secondly, his desire not to bring the cake home. We'll say, have another piece. <laughs> have one on me. Take a couple of pieces home with you. And I just might give in to temptation and have all the cake that I want, much to the detriment of my shirts, my pants, my waist, and my belt. Temptation and the tempter. But before we actually got into the tempter and the temptation of evil, we asked because of the phrasing of verse 13, do not lead us into temptation, we are looking at the question, does God tempt us? And as far as God luring us into sin and the mindset that... that uh, uh, comes to mind uh, that we think of when sometimes we read this verse and other verses is that maybe sometimes God plays games with us and, and puts things in our lives or puts us in situations to see if we'll mess up or not. Uh, just for his own purposes. Just like, you know, th there are people, well, I think the best example today that we can look at are are, are what, uh, and some of you might know what I'm talking about, pe people known as internet trolls. And, and you might be saying, what's an internet troll? Well, uh, today in this day and age of, 
of social media and, and being able to post comments on, on stories and different things, there are people who will answer or comment the most outrageous comments on different stories or different statements that people make, not because they believe those things, or maybe they do, but the, the real reason they make these outrageous comments is to get people all upset, all excited, uh, get them to lose their temper and get them to kind of respond in kind by, by one-upping their outrageous comment with another. And again, the reason they do that is just to, to get people going. Um, it's been said of me that there are times I like to get people going <laughs> by punching their buttons. And some people think that's, as far as the moving of God in their lives, you know, when we, we don't understand, when we go through some unpleasant, if not horrific things, is God messing with me, if I could use that term this morning? Well, one thing we can be assured of, and we've, we've talked about this, so I'm going to move through it very quickly. According to the book of James, God does not tempt anyone with evil. He will not bring you to a place of sin. He does not want to see you fail. God is for you. And if God be for you, as Scripture says, who can be against you? Amen? Amen. But we have and are taking a look at three individuals whom God didn't tempt to uh, engage in evil, but whom he tested, and, and the aspect he tested was their faith. We took time to look at the man Abraham. Abraham waited for years. How many years? 99 years. For a son of promise. The man, the, uh, the, the child Isaac to be born. And, and Isaac was born, and Isaac was a, a wonderful, beautiful child. His name means laughter. He brought joy to the household. And then one day when I believe uh, Isaac, and you can correct me on this, when Isaac was about 11 or 12 years old, God says to Abraham, take your son, your only son, and offer him as a sacrifice to me. Bring him up to Mount Moriah. Slay him and consume his body in a sacrifice. And God did this for a reason, not to mess with Abraham's mind and definitely not to kill Isaac for it was God's intent, never his intent to, to kill the child. But he did it to test or prove that Abraham was not only a man of faith, he was a man of extraordinary faith. And this was demonstrated by both his deeds, faith without works is dead, but also his heart. His deeds and that he was ready to do it. He had the knife... And he, as he was getting ready to plunge that knife into the heart of his son, God said, stop. Now I see that there's nothing that you will not do that I command. Paraphrasing. Faith without works is dead. And secondly, the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, because not only did God command Abraham at that moment to slay his son Isaac, God at no time said that it nullified the calling of God upon Isaac's life that he and his descendants would become a great nation. And in Abraham's heart, the Bible says in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, that even though Isaac would die that day and even though his body would be consumed, God would raise him up. And he would fulfill God's promise. 
great, unshakable faith. Secondly, last week we took a, a look at the man Hezekiah, who on the outside looked good, but on the inside there was hidden pride. And because God loved Hezekiah, and because pride is anathema to God, God hates pride. Pride goes before the fall. It was, for the re it was for the reason of pride that Satan himself fell from his estate as the anointed cherub that covers, according to Ezekiel chapter 28. And rather than see Hezekiah continue in his pride, he tested him. Not to destroy him, but to show the flaws that was in his heart. And Hezekiah came to a place of, uh, of confession, of repentance, of healing, of redemption. And now we're going to look at the, what some may say, and I think for good reason, the greatest test of all, that being the test of the man, Job, who suffered greatly in his life at the hands of Satan, but under the permission of God. And this, this suffering and this test was also for a purpose. And I believe beyond the shadow of a doubt today that purpose was for faith, specifically a more perfect faith. Now before we read his story, and we're going to take a little time to read his story, we briefly went over it uh, a few weeks ago when we started this sub-series on Does God Test Us? There is, when you come to Jesus, and I think this is universal, in that um, people who come to Jesus think this about God. And secondly, people who don't know Jesus, but know about uh, the, the Christian God, the one and only true God, Jesus, they believe that this is true, or at least, at least this is what Christians believe to be true about Jesus. Is number one, he is good, or he is kind, and number two, he is just. This is brought out for us in Psalm 145, verse 17. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his deeds. I thought I'd get an amen out of that. <laughs> amen, amen. If I was to read that as an opening scripture this morning, I would have got a lot of amens. Praise the Lord. And if I said in all seriousness, I'm not being facetious this morning, do you believe that brothers and sisters in Christ, you would all say yes. And when things are going good, we do believe this. Amen? Amen. I came here this morning... Almost as soon as I got in my car, the rain stopped. Rosanna, was it raining when we came in this morning? Rosanna's always the first one here. Is it a little sprinkle? The rain stopped. I was in a beautiful car. I'm, I'm wearing nice clothing. It's warm in here, praise the Lord. Everything's good. I, I feel good. I feel healthy. I see all of you. You look healthy and happy. Life is good, and God is good. Amen. But life isn't always good, is it? There is trial, there is difficulty, and there is a temptation, although we know in our minds to be true, to question whether or not that statement, the Lord is righteous 
and kind in all his ways, whether or not that is true. And that's exactly what happened to Job. Let's just read the beginning of his story for those who may, be, may not be too familiar with him. Um, reading from Job chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job, and that man was blameless, upright, fearing God, and turning away from evil. Seven sons and three daughters were born to him. His possessions also were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and very many servants. And that man was the greatest of all men, all the men in the, of the east. His sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one on his day, and they would send an invite. Uh, and, and they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. When the days of feasting had completed their cycle, Job would send and consecrate them, rising up early in the morning and offering burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, Perhaps my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, from, when, from where do you come? And then Satan answered the Lord and said, From roaming about on the earth and walking around on it. The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? For there is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil. Then Satan answered the Lord, Does, God, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge about him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But put forth your hand now and touch all that he has. He will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not put forth your hand on him. So Satan departed from the presence of the Lord. We have this man. A great man... Not because of his wealth, although he was wealthy. A great man because he was upright, blameless, and godly. According to the word of the Lord himself, God found no fault in him. Wow. Can that be said of you this morning? Ask Raylene, that cannot be said of me. <laughs> but in all seriousness, and of course Satan, and we're going to get to Satan, uh, not next Sunday, because Joe will be preaching next Sunday, but the following Sunday uh, we'll most likely get to him. But Satan, one of the things that he is, is an accuser of the brethren. He loves to bring people under condemnation. And here he is in a full assault against the character of Job. And he says to God, well, the only reason why Job serves you is because you've blessed him. I would love just to wreak havoc upon his life, but there's a spiritual hedge, there's a spiritual protection uh, around him. I cannot touch him. And God says, okay, I give you permission just to spare his, his life or just spare his health. Don't touch his body. And so from the, after that encounter with God, the Bible says uh, war, uh, neighboring parties came and took everything that Job owned. His, 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 his donkeys, his, uh, his sheep, his camels, all, all of his wealth. And that was wealth in those days uh, in addition to gold and silver. All of it was gone seemingly in a day. At least that's the way it reads in Job chapter 1. And during one of these parties, and uh, I don't know much about Job's sons other than they like, they like to party, and that's a kind of a different story for, or a different message for a different time. But they were all in one house having a party together, and the Bible says that a wind came and the house collapsed and all seven, all ten of Job's children died that day. But the story doesn't end there. 
And Job, the Bible says, did not charge God foolishly. But then we go on to chapter 2, and, and he didn't say anything. And there, there's this famous quote that many of us know. Even those who aren't familiar with the Bible are familiar with this quote. Naked I came into the world, naked I will leave. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job did not choo choo uh, uh, accuse God foolishly. And so everything was the same other than the fact that Job had no family now. And then Satan comes back again and, sa and God says, have you considered my servant Job? He's upright in heart, even though you incited me against him for no good reason. And that's an important thing to understand, too, is that when trial and difficulty comes, it doesn't mean that you've been bad. And there's sometimes God chastens us, but there's sometimes that hard times come just because hard times come. It's, it's a consequence of living in this fallen world. Of course, Satan responds skin for skin. If you afflict his body, he'll curse you to his face. And God, God said, go ahead, but spare his life. And Job came down with a disease so horrific, painful boils from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. Disfigured him, his friends didn't even recognize who he was. I can't imagine, I, I, you know, I, I, I've had, uh, I wouldn't even call them boils, I guess they're just kind of big pimples and know how uncomfortable that they can be. I can't imagine huge boils and the odor. His wife said, why don't you just curse God and die? But Job refused to deny God and kept his faith and integrity. Um, kept his faith and, and the integrity of his faith as far as trusting God with his heart. Now, as I mentioned before, this... Now, Job knew none of this. And it's important to note that, um, as we will see later. But Job, all he knew is that bad stuff was happening to him. He, he was someone who served God faithfully. He was serving God with all of his heart. He believed and trusted in God and his life was literally in ruins. One thing we can note about this, number one, there was no anger or malice of intent as far as God. At no time during this was God angry with or neither did he have an intent to make Job suffer just for some nefarious reason as, as some twisted human beings like to do in the lives of, of other individuals. Job also, or God rather, also not only acknowledged but boasted of Job's righteousness. He, he was the star pupil. If, if he was here today, he'd be, you know, the, um, one of the things the Apostle Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. He'd be one of those guys that you would want to look at his life and, and, and see what he had going on as far as his relationship with the Lord. God said that he was innocent. There was, there was no reason for this as far as discipline or judgment to happen. And although God was silent, God never left Job. We know that because at the end of the book, 
Job or God responds to every word that Job said while he was going through this season of suffering. And that God never stopped loving Job. As far as faith, the Bible says in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, it's one of my favorite scriptures. You probably, if you've listened to me for any amount of time, you probably know it's Hebrews 11, 6. Faith is, no, no, no. That's without faith is impossible. 11, 1. With, um, faith is the evidence of things hoped for, the substance of things not seen. Faith is trusting God in who He is and who He says He is through His Word in spite of what we might be experiencing with our five senses. That is what faith is. And here Job was being tested and, and for, for good reason, as we will see as we go through this, whether he, under every circumstance, even when the evidence would, would point to the fact that God was not just, or that God was not kind, Job was being tested, is your faith so perfect that you will still believe in my righteousness, my justice, my kindness, even when my world is being, your world is being destroyed. And again, this wasn't to expose, you know, to expose a weakness in Job. The reason for this, because as, as we'll see in a few moments, God was trying to bring Job to a greater place of faith in him. The reason for this was not to destroy him, but to make his faith even greater than it was. Does not the book of Philippians, chapter 1, verse 6, say, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it unto the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. The book of Ephesians talks about the ministry gifts of God. Apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, evangelist. For what reason? For the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. God through, now this isn't the only way, but you and I, because we are a, a beautiful picture, a beautiful sculpture, we are in some ways a, a beautiful building. And what I mean by that is we are a project that, that God begins when we accept the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, is one that he constantly works on, adjusts, builds upon, until it becomes something beautiful. I mean, I'm not a painter, but as far as, you know, painting a picture... You don't just draw, you know, I, I've seen, you know, like a portrait. They have the circle with the, the, the cross where the eye line's supposed to be in the nose. And you can see, oh, okay, there, there's a picture of a man or a woman. But you just don't stop there. Then you put in the features. And then you move on from the features to, to the coloring and to the shading and to the hair. And, and then you just don't have it against a white background. You put something in the back. Why? To, to make the object of that picture stand out even greater. It's 
a work that is in process, and it's the same as far as our faith. We grow from faith to faith. And one of, the way our, one of the ways that our faith grows, in addition to spending time with the Lord Jesus Christ in prayer, the more you spend in the presence of God, the more your faith grows. Spending time in the Word of God. You know, faith comes by hearing. Hearing the Word of God. Spending time with other believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Spending time under the anointed teaching and preaching of the Word of God. Serving God. God brings us through unpleasant circumstances. Why? Because he just wants to mess with you or he wants to build your faith in him that you will become a man or a woman who trusts him regardless of anything that's going on. That's what was happening in Job's life. Now, now, as God said, Job was perfect. Job was upright. Loved God. Was devoted with God. But when he went through this horrendous season, I'm not trying to minimize this at all. It was, I would hate to go through this. He had some issues with what God was bringing him through. And, and the best way to find out what was going on, as far as not only from God's perspective, but in Job's life, is to see what both God and Job said to each other at the end of the story. It, was, it just wasn't a matter of, okay, Satan, have your way with Job. I hope he makes it. We'll see him. I hope to see him when he dies. Hope he maintains his faith. Job 38, 1 and 2. The Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this? Now, prior to this, chapters 3 through uh, 37 are a series of conversations between Job and, and four of his friends. And uh, not to get into the details of it, but a lot of what his friends were saying was not helpful. They were, and I think, and I wasn't going to talk about this, but I think it's important that we talk about it because it, it helps add context sometimes to the suffering that we're going through. The friends, and we are going to, and we will re revisit this, the gist of what the friends had to say to Job was, maybe... You're not as holy and just as you think you are. Because if you were holy and just as you think you are, or we think you are, none of these things would have happened. And it went from him at the beginning. There were, there were uh, several, I think at least three exchanges between Job's friends and, and Job. Uh, between those, it begins with maybe you just got a little thing in your life that God wants to get out. And by the end, you, you know, you, uh, uh, you, you killed children, you oppressed the poor, you're a rotten, miserable human being, and, and you're getting exactly what you deserve. Sometimes our friends don't help us when we go through times of difficulty. May it never be said of believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, but... We'll get to that in just a moment. And we can look through different scriptures as far as what Job said, but um, regarding his belief, not in the existence of God. Job, throughout this, did not deny, number one, that God existed. Nor did he deny that God was his savior. One of the most famous portions of scripture is from, uh, from Job. Uh, or, uh, one of the most powerful is chapter 19 verses 25 through 27. Job says this, As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives. And at the last, he will take his stand on the earth. And even after my skin is destroyed, yet from my flesh I shall see God, who I myself shall behold, and whom my eyes will see, and not another. My heart faints 
within me. Two important things that Job never gave up on. Number one, that God exists. And number two, that God was his redeemer. That even though someday he might die, God would raise him up again. And in his flesh, his new flesh, I might add, he would see God face to face. Unshakable. There are times as believers where, he, where we go through seasons of difficulty, through testings. And again, there's a reward for going through testings. Blessed is the man who endureth temptation. They shall receive a crown of life. James chapter 1. But we still believe in Jesus as our Savior. And we still believe, you know, that he died on the cross, that he rose again, that our sins are forgiven. And we believe that when we die, we're going to, to be with him. But, especially when life is going good for the other guy, especially other guys who maybe don't seem as righteous and as holy as we are or as devoted as we are, we bring into question whether or not God is truly just or, and God, or fair. God is truly righteous or right or good. And if God is truly kind. This was the heart of Job. And, and, uh, and we know this by... Uh, the different things God said about him. Three portions of scripture from Job. Verse 38, 1 and 2. Finally, God speaks. The Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Again, what was understood about God as far as him being right and good and just. Job was challenging this. It was challenging his heart. Job chapter 40, verse 1 and 2, the Lord said to Job, Will the fault finder contend with the Almighty? Let him who repro reproves God answer it. He acknowledged that God exists. And he acknowledged that God was his Savior. But he brought into question whether God was perfect in all of his ways. And I'm not condemning Job this morning. In fact, have we all not been in the same place? Later on, the same chapter, verses 7 through 9. Now gird up your loins like a man, I will ask you, and, instruct, and you instruct me. Will you really annul my judgment? Will you condemn me that you may be justified? Or do you have an arm like God, and can you thunder with a voice like his? Job questions God. Job judges God because he finds fault with the things, with God as far as the things that he is experiencing in his life. And he struggles with the belief that God is not perfectly just or fair. And is this not a similar struggle that you and I go through? We experience difficulties. And, and, and I don't know about you, but there have been times in my life where, you know, a lot of good things were happening, but there's one bad thing. Eh, that's all right. Or maybe even two you know, really unpleasant things, but there's so many good things. But there have also been seasons when everything is just going crazy. And because although we're people of faith living by faith and not sight, we live in a world and experience all the chaos and pain and confusion and hurt that comes with these things and wonder, God, even if we don't speak it, God, are you truly just? Are you truly right? 
Are you truly good? And then God speaks. And a wonderful thing happens, and I am drawing down to a close this morning. A wonderful thing happens. And it all has to do with faith. Number one is this. Hear me this morning. It's, it's somewhat of a, I'm not going to say it's a bitter pill. But it's definitely not a sweet one. That being this, the struggles that you go through isn't always about you. I know you're going through it. And it feels personal, but a lot of times it's not about us, it's about other people. And even though Job didn't understand this, and we'll talk about him in a moment, there were other people profoundly affected by the working of Job through this season of difficulty. Number one was his friends. His friends were not only bad friends. They weren't only judgmental and critical and spiritually ignorant. They were wicked and evil. Why? Because they misunderstood God and they were dragging others down with them in their misunderstanding. What they were guilty of, uh, Jesus describes so, so well, and again, it's a verse that practically everybody knows, even un unbelievers. Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. Do not judge so that you will not be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. They saw Job. They saw the magnitude of what he was experiencing and they came to the conclusion the reason he's, there's something wrong with this guy. There, and, and isn't it maddening when someone accuses you of something you know you haven't done? And here Job is dealing with this weight of all this suffering and he has his friends. You are wicked. You are evil. And it was bad for Job, but it was worse for them. Why? Because Matthew 7, 2. By your standard of your measure, it will be measured to you. You know, when we judge people harshly, when we're not gracious and merciful to others, what, does, what is Jesus saying there as far as what we can expect when we stand before God? Is God going to be merciful and gracious to us if we've not been to other people? God, through Job's suffering, brought about a great correction in the lives of these three men. So far, Eliphaz and Bildad, I think that was who they were. They were in, in danger of strict judgment, falling under the exact same strict judgment. Wickedness when there was none. Because the same standard of measurement, same standard that you use to judge people is the same standard that God will use to you. And God brought, I believe, and I'm inferring this this morning, a new graciousness and a new humility to these three men who didn't go through that suffering. Secondly, God showed up Satan. How great is the saving power of the Lord Jesus Christ? He saves what 
to the uttermost. Amen? And what He does within us, this is not an internal security <laughs> statement. So, I mean, people walk away from God. But what He takes away from us, no one, or what He gives to us, no one can take away. Satan was saying to God, mankind, your saving work and grace in them that cannot save them because the, the least little thing that happens, they'll go right, they'll come right back to me. They'll, they'll begin to serve, they'll curse you and they'll come right back to me and they'll serve me once again. And God proved Satan wrong. Mankind can be redeemed because the power of God is great enough. And we also receive a benefit from this. And the benefit of that is this. We look at what different people are going through in their lives. And, and we see you know, them being faithful. Or just hear you know, a tragedy of someone going through... I, I know because I've experienced it. And I've heard other people say it. People say, I hope that never happens to me. Because I don't think I could make it. I don't think I could keep my faith in Jesus. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Because your faith in God is real. Now, although Satan might take... Everything away from you. God is strong enough to keep you. In Jesus' name. And lastly, as far as Job himself. And there may be more. I'm not saying I'm the final authority on Job. I'm, I'm still a, 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 a work in progress and a learning work in progress. The response of Job isn't, well, you know, I just kind of wanted to show you what your friends, I wanted to work in your friends' lives, or, you know, Satan was saying this, and I just wanted to prove to Satan. He didn't say any of that. How God responded is, basically, who are you to question me? And he compared his greatness and his knowledge and his wisdom with that of Job by talking about his eternal nature and power. Where were you when the foundations of the world were laid? Now, it is not the world... I'm, I'm, try, try to stay with me. I'm not trying to get off the subject. But is not the world a wonder... even in its fallen state, a wonderful, curious miraculous place. And, and really, science has just kind of scratched the surface as far as what existence is all about. And those, those I'm sure, who, who study science and go deeper into science, and I know there's a, that new telescope that's going out farther and farther and seeing things even more clearly, are finding out how truly miraculous and wonderful, and, and what's, I think, the most miraculous about it is, is that in all the things that could happen, both in the natural, but also politically and, and otherwise, this, this world should not, should not have ever existed, and this world should not have endured to now. I mean, how long have we been in the nuclear age? It's... Uh, we're, we're getting probably about 80 years, getting close to 80 years. When, when, was, when was the... Hey, Jim, when, when did the bomb fall? You remember when that happened? I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm sorry, I should have thrown that in there. <laughs> Poor Jim. It exists! The book of Proverbs says, it is by wisdom God set the seven pillars of creation. 
And at your voice do the, do, do, do the waters move? Do the heavens shake? Are you anywhere in any way not only near me but able to comprehend who I am and what I do and the conclusion that Job came to is no. Job 42, 1 through 3, Job answered the Lord and said, I know you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have declared that which I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. And God's purpose was not just to make Job feel very small. I want you to feel small. God's purpose was to bring him to a greater place of faith where he believed not only in God, but in the justice, the goodness, uh, the, the, the righteousness of God despite what he sees in the world. I, I think a good scripture that encompasses this, Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, my thoughts are not your thoughts, God speaking, nor are, my, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my way is higher than your ways, and my thoughts, your thoughts. God gave Job a greater revelation of his power and his wisdom, and therefore brought him to a greater place of faith, of complete trust. So where does that leave us? I think two things. Because bad stuff's going to happen. And not always because, you know, God is sending a, a test our way, and, as he did in Abraham and Hezekiah and Job, but because we live in an imperfect world where it rains on the just and the unjust. Someday it will be perfect. Jesus is coming, but right now we're subject to... We're going to die. Floods and things will happen. Wars and other atrocities because man is in control. What do, we, what do we do about our struggles? Our questions. God, where are you in this? I don't see goodness in this either in my life. And, and you know... To bring us to this place of questioning God, it's not always what happens to us. It's sometimes it's what's happening to someone else, someone we care about. Or even people we don't know. Who, you know, you know, God, why why do you allow this tragedy to happen to you know this group of people or, or children or, or things like that? They're very real, they're very tough questions. And and of course, you know, to build faith, we need to spend, you know, do the things that, that we need to do as far as a follower of Christ, uh, studying the Word of God and spending time with God, things we mentioned before. But the most important thing that we can do, which Job kind of did, um, but um, he kind of did, but, but God answered it anyways. And what I mean by that, one of Job's complaints was that I wish I could go before God and present my case. I think he, there, you know, there's a belief that God didn't really understand what he was going through. And he wanted to, he wanted to prove himself right before God. And he didn't think that there was a way. And lo and behold, what happens at the end? God speaks to him out of the whirlwind. 38, 39, and 40. Three chapters worth. We have someone who always hears. God always hears, always sees. And we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus. Amen?
And we can take all of our questions. I'm not saying it's right to question God, because it really isn't. If God, since God is God, we just by faith need to accept that what He does is good. But having said that, when we wrestle with these things, we can ask. Job didn't think he could ask, but we know that we can ask. Amen? And God may give us the same answer of Job. He may give us not he may not give us the answer that we're looking for, but I tell you what he will give us. And that is his grace which is more than enough. His grace is sufficient.